Amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask that you turn to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, while you're turning there, uh, we'd ask you to be much in prayer always for me as your pastor and uh, that the Lord would guide me and lead me into what uh, needs to be done. I always want to be found in His will. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 14, the Bible says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doeth the canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. Now concerning the truth, they bear truth have erred from who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrown the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care. We pray that you would bless this little church that we would be found doing the honor and the glory to your name always. And Lord, we pray uh, for the work here, that it, what would be accomplished would glorify you for the what was done in Aaron yesterday, Lord, that you would use uh, what was done to bring glory into thyself. Lord, we pray that you would use it to draw people to you. God, we pray for the little mission there at Paris, God, that it would be glory and an honor to you, Lord, and we might see some saved because of your grace in that place. Lord, now we pray that you would bless your holy word to the hearing of your people, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, some very familiar verses of Scripture, and we're going to look at it maybe in a little bit different way, and we're going to emphasize the fact of what that he says in 19 he knoweth those that are his. He, uh, the Lord knoweth them that are his. He knows us individually. He knows who we are. He knew us before the world began. He knows us even today. Not one thing comes across the screen that our God doesn't know about. And if that were not true, that would steal from his sovereignty, would it not? Yeah. He don't even, uh, not the, the most tragic of illness, listen, he certainly understood that. And more likely than not, he, he prescribed it. Now, I think any individual could be like unto Job, and the Lord God of heaven uh, goes unto Satan himself and says, Have you considered Job? And there's none like him in the whole earth. And sometimes he will do that for you too. Have you considered Jared? Uh, and uh, it's kind of an humbling, a humbling thing, but certainly he knows everything about us. He knows us by name. Now, what a thrilling and wonderful truth, you know, I, I, I've never been satisfied with my name, and I don't know very many people who are, uh, I always thought it was kind of hokey, and, and kind of a 60s looking name, and I know my mother-in-law's never liked her given name, and uh, it's just kind of how it is, but you know what, isn't it a wonderful, glorious thing this morning, he knows us by name, even if we don't like our name, he still knows exactly who we are, and we, he knows us by name. And that's a big reason to give glory and praise this morning. Now, as Paul is writing to young Timothy, you know your order of the Bible. This is, uh, uh, Paul was ready to be offered. He knew the time of his departure was very close. 
And, and he was trying to instill some things into the younger pastors because he knew that they would have to carry on and, and give it to the next generation behind them. And, and, and that is critical as the Lord's people that we do it, not just only pastors, but you as individuals transfer the faith to the next generation. Right. Uh, cause them to love it even like you do. And so Paul understood this, and as he's writing these final things to, uh, to young Timothy, he wants him, him to remember some things. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Mm -hmm. Now, the things that he was talking about, he had already said. The things that he had mentioned uh, were, were already uh, what he had previously said. Uh, verse 1, he says, uh, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He says, I want you to remember that when everything else goes wrong, be strong in grace. Be strong. Uh, claim the unmerited favor of God when, when things are very, very difficult, when, when there's hardship about the place. Claim grace. And everybody always thinks of saving grace and certainly what a wonderful thing. But you know what? There's a living grace too. Uh, when you get bad news from the doctor, claim it. When, when the bank account's empty, claim it. There's a living grace that belongs to every one of us. And if it were not true, I, surely we would be dead. Surely we would be dead. And, and so we find then, by the goodness of God, he reminds Timothy, you, uh, you be strong in that. You be, you be hearty in grace. Verse four, uh, verse four, no man that warreth entangling, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Now, I want you to notice in four that another thing that Paul had reminded him of, listen, don't get too involved in this world. And man, we love it, do we not? We, we like money, we like houses, we like lands, and we, we find the rich one, rich young ruler, the Bible said, went away sorrowful because he, uh, he was of great means. We don't need to get too entangled in that. That's why he advises us to behave like pilgrims and strangers. Don't put your roots down too deep. Listen, this thing's over like that. And, and, and then the Bible says, then who will those things be? And so we find then that he reminds young Timothy, don't get caught up in the world. And certainly he could. He was a young man, had the majority of the life in front of him. He says, don't get too hung up on that. Uh, verse 6, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of must be first partaker of the fruits. Now I want you to notice two things. First of all, the husbandman takes care of the vineyard. He doesn't make the vineyard. He doesn't increase the vineyard. It is his responsibility to see that it's watered and it's nurtured and the weeds are pulled and it's well taken care of. That that's his responsibility as the husbandman. But notice what it says, that he must first be the partaker. Now, a lot of people would say, well, he's getting his first fruits. That's not what the Bible says. You cannot understand sound, good preaching if you're lost. You've got to be a partaker of the fruit before you can teach about the fruit. Because... Uh, you only learn that by experience. We can we can read the Bible and study it in depthly, but you know it's nothing unless you've been born again. I mean, uh, you think about your natural interest, and I doubt there's anybody except maybe Donnie and I in the room, maybe my mother-in-law, uh, that finds human anatomy just fascinating. I can teach it to you, but you don't have a passion for it. And, I, and pretty much anybody can learn anything, but that don't make you redeemed. That don't make you saved. <clears throat> that don't make you born again. So Paul says, listen, if you've not touched it, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, uh, if, you don't, if you've never been born again, this is not for you. He reminds him of this. Now drop down to verse 11. He is a it is a faithful saying for if we be dead with him, we also shall live with him. 
Now, th th that's kind of a self-evaluation if you have died unto Christ. Now, if you have died unto Christ, that means everything you have, every fiber of your being, not just money, not just houses, not just land, but your thoughts, your strength, everything is committed unto Christ. You know what? I think there's few and far between people that, that really live that way. Yeah. Uh, very difficult to find people are that committed. And so he again reminds young Timothy, he says, review yourself. See if this is the condition that you are finding yourself in. This is where you should be. Then in verse 14, of these things put them, meaning the church, in remembrance. Be sure you have all that lined up. Be sure that you are truly converted. You've been born again. Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive now not about words to no profit. So he said, you know, and, and that was happening in a lot of the early uh, New Testament churches is they were they were getting all hung up about baptism was an example of who baptized you and who baptized you. And they were kind of came braggarts about it. And, and Paul set the Corinthian church straight about that and says, it doesn't matter who baptized you. That, that's insignificant. And haven't you seen people strive over words? I've seen people get down to this point. When did election happen? And when did predestination happen? Well, at first, I think they're essentially the same thing, don't you? Mm -hmm. And if there is a difference in that work of God, how would we know that? How would we know the, the agenda of God? You know what that is? That's just striving at words. It's just having something to talk about. You know what that is? It's foolishness. I would a whole lot rather say to somebody, listen, grace, Jesus saves. Grace is the means of the atonement. Grace is the way to approach the throne of God than, than trying to figure out the difference between predestination and election. You know what? That's not within man's scope. I really believe that. It is not within man's scope to know stuff like that. And, and so we find, as uh, Paul is teaching, he says, don't get hung up on words. Verse 15, study to shew thyself approved unto God. Now, I want you to notice two things. A lot of people, again, they, they understood the youthfulness of young Timothy, and they emphasized that, and no doubt he was uh, questioned very frequently because of his youth. I believe he was stressed out. He had a stomach condition. He was so stressed out about it. But I want you to see where does his approval come from? Was he just studying himself so much that he impressed the elders? Was he just study so hard that, that the Jewish people would listen to him too? He said, no, no. Study thyself to be approved unto God. Isn't that the essential one? Isn't that the most critical thing? That God is well pleased with your ministry and not other men? Isn't it, isn't it an important, the most important thing that God is well pleased when you stand before Him? Listen, there's nobody else going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, but it will be the judgment of the Almighty. And so He says, listen, you study to, uh, to shew thyself self approved unto God. A workman that not, needeth not to be ashamed, rightly decide, dividing the word, of, uh, the word of truth. Now, I also want you to see that he says uh, a workman, that you, you don't need to be ashamed. You know what? I've often wondered how churches today, how the pastor goes about not be ashamed of someone. Uh, the people look like the world. They act like the world. They don't know beans about the Bible. How could they not be ashamed of it? And he says, listen, you study to show thyself approved, and you be happy when, when, when you get that information, when, when, when your people begin to understand and know the truth. That's really what it's all about, is not it? It's not about numbers. It's not about getting people in here. It's simply, and he says, so, uh, 
you be uh, see yourself approved. See uh, get be faithful to the ministry, and you'll be ashamed of it. Verse sixteen. But shun profane, but shun profane and vain babblings. Now, not only does this, I believe there was already uh, Pentecostalism growing in that day. A lot of people say uh, it didn't uh, didn't really approve to the late 1800s. That junk's been around a long time. Uh, anything that feels good to the flesh has been around just about since the flesh started, right? <laughs> And, and, and so that, that, that's not a new bag, as some people, and, and they do, they babble and carry on, but listen, in addition to that flopping on the ground and hollering out and junk, in addition to that, you know, a vain babbling can be as simple as this, salvation is in baptism. That's a vain babbling, you know why? Number one, it's about you, so that makes it vain. I can do it. I can submit to baptism. I can uh, get so and so to baptize me. And secondly, it's a bad one. There's no truth in it. There, there's not one note of scripture to validate that. A vein all about you and a falsehood, a bad one. Just, just, just carrying on stuff that doesn't even uh, doesn't even coincide with the scriptures. And so he says, be careful of that. Say, and notice what he says. He says, shun it. He didn't say to scream against it. He didn't say to mark people out. But he says, just avoid it. Shun it. Say, you know what? That's not true. I don't want any part of that whatsoever. Shun it. Don't, don't get involved in it. And notice what he warns him of. For they, those idle tales those vain babblings that people talk about themselves and how great they are, they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, that means departure from the truth. That means uh, creating their own doctrine. And you, you, you watch those type of people, and many of them today, listen, you go into uh, a Pentecostal service, and it's like a rock concert from the 80s. You know why? It's increased. It feels better to the flesh, more better to the flesh now than it did then. It just increases and increases. And, and you know, the flesh being what it is, you're never going to satisfy it. So you're going to have to give more and more and more and more to entertain this wicked flesh. And that's what, and he, so he says, be very cautious of that, young Timothy. And there, meaning those individuals that pr uh, that produce this, this false doctrine, and their word, word will eat as doth a canker of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, a canker is cancer. Now, uh, you know you know what the best treatment for cancer is? Cut it out. You find it early and cut it out. It's still true today. Now, first of all, sometimes. Uh, finding it early is a difficult thing. And you know why we don't want to acknowledge something's wrong, do we? No. And everybody says, oh man, he's a tough old bird. No, no. He's ignoring his needs. That's, that's the issue. It don't matter how tough he is. You know what? Uh, little forgiveness sometimes. You know, you know what the issue is? I have ignored it. Right? Just acknowledge it. And, and, and he says, and, and so he says that if you if you ignore cancer long enough, by the time you acknowledge it, it you're you're good as dead. Mm -hmm. And if you ignore spiritual cankers long enough, by the by time you acknowledge them, you'll be spiritually dead. And, and so we find that as he's talking about these two individuals. Their cancer, their cancer was a false doctrine that they were bringing in and among the Lord's people, saying the resurrection's passed already. That has already happened. And you know what? That that's <laughs> if you read about the resurrection of the dead, following the uh, following the resurrection of Christ, that's where they get that. And that's why uh, the, 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 the doctrine of Abraham's bosom is being rejected today. You know what that is? It's teaching a general resurrection. It's exactly what it's teaching. And, and, and so we find then that <laughs> Paul said that that was false even then. He said the resurrection is not passed already. 
The resurrection has just come. And, and, and so we find that that doctrine is still very much heavily out there and it has to be addressed. And this is the good news. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. When all hell's breaking loose everywhere else, that limestone steady rock is just as sure as it was as the day that he said, let there be light. It is still as strong. It is still as secure. It is still as faithful as it's ever been. It standeth sure, strong. You know, that's something that you can uh, build, build your faith. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that happens perchance. There's nothing in the Bible that, that's not written for our benefit. And I often think uh, as, uh, as Jacob is ex uh, escaping his life from Esau, what did he place his head on? A rock. Just as sure and steady. But you know what? He went out and hooked up with a, with a heathen and spent 20 years down there. You know what? Saved people can do that. Now, I believe they will come back, and we know from the story of Jacob who became Israel but that, that he certainly did. But um, I wouldn't want to stand up there too long, would you? Uh -uh. And, and so we find that Jacob, uh, we find that uh, the foundation is always there. It's always present. It's always steady. It's always secure. Nevertheless, the foundation of God's strength is sure, having this seal. Now, a lot of people will ignore that part of the verse, and nothing wrong with emphasizing the foundation, but the seal is more important. The seal is the signet of the Almighty God in heaven. It, you don't, no one removes that seal but the one that made it. A seal is uh, it's like the seal on the envelope. You, you put the message in and you seal it up. And in those days, the seal, the signet that went on it was the person who stuffed the envelope and sent it away. And nobody but the person that it was addressed to could break the seal. Remember in the Revelation when uh, um, they were looking for somebody to break the seals and they couldn't find nobody? That's what it's about. It's only addressed for certain people. Right. And, and, and they finally found the Lord Jesus and he broke the seals. Amen. He opened them up. Very, very same thing. That seal belongs to God. That, that's why we're not depending on ourselves. He is a very sure and present help in time of need. He is strong and brave and glorious. And whatever you might be facing, he is before you and he secures the way. The Lord knoweth them that are his. You know what? Uh, it used to stress me out when people uh, uh, said, well, I don't even believe in God. Don't stress me out no more. I'll pray for them. I'll go to bed and, and put them before the Lord. But you know what? He knows those that are his and he don't know those that are not in the sense of redemption. And it is not my problem. He knows my name. What a wonderful thing. Now, I don't like to, uh, I don't like to emphasize the damned, the non-elect, the vessels of wrath, whatever you want to call them. He's fine with me. But you know what? I like to emphasize the fact he knows my name. I'm sealed. That seal's right here. And for the everlasting ages, it will keep me and make me. And when I stand before him, all I'll be able to do is praise his everlasting name. Uh. What a glorious, wonderful truth. He knows my name. Whatever you may be facing this morning, whatever difficulty may be, uh, be before you, if you're saved, He knows your name. He knows who you are. He is sovereign and mighty and glorious, and He knows our name. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now we think of iniquity very often. We'll jump off into alcohol and drugs and drinks and right. But you know, it's a very horrible thing to hate somebody, isn't it? It's a very, very horrible thing yeah. to, to take opposition immediately when you see somebody. Mm -hmm. And I have people like that. I, there are certain people in my family, not you guys, in my family, that as soon as I see them, I get mad. 
I mean, they don't even have to say anything. And I get mad. You know what? Shame on me. Yeah. Shame on me. They're doing exactly what their nature tells them to do. I should do what my new nature tells me to do and not listen to the old nature. And, and, and so we find that as Paul is writing to young Timothy, he, remind, he reminds them, listen, if they say they're Christians, they ought to be acting like it. They ought to be presenting. Let everyone that, everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. Now let me say this, and we're going to move on to another section of Scripture, but I want you to see that he uh, speaks of the vessels of honor and dishonor, the elect and the damned, and I want you to see he, apparently from the context that I'm reading, maybe Brother Jerry can straighten me out by coming angling, uh, but he's talking to a church Timothy pastored the church at Ephesus, right? So apparently, Paul knew full well there were some fakes there. Right? Because he said there, there, there's some in that assembly yeah. that are vessels of wrath, that are vessels that dishonor me. They're wood, they're hay, they're stubble, they won't last. And, and, and so we find then that the way, <laughs> the way that I understand it just because you're in the Lord's church and you have some sound preaching the majority of your life do not mean that you belong to Him, but rather measure yourself by the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith. Against, their such, uh, against such there is no law. Are they present in your life? Now, Gospel of John chapter 1. I love this scripture. John chapter number one, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 44. John 1 and verse 44, the Bible says this, And the day following, Jesus would go forth unto Galilee, and findeth Philip, and he saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethesda, the city of Andrew, and Peter. And Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found of him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no God. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, listen, it wasn't the fact that he went by and said, There's Nathanael. He kept on going wherever he was headed. He saw him. In his heart, in his mind, and there you have the very living God, the, man, the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom Jared spoke of this morning, that, that we have no ability to understand. And he says, Nathaniel, I saw you. You were there under the tree. He sees me this morning here. He sees me on the workplace. He sees wherever I go and wherever I'm at. He knows where I am. What a wonderful and glorious thing. You know what? What a great and wonderful God it is that He put me in the, in the exact position to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ when it would become meaningful and real unto me for the very first time. He knows where I'm at. This morning, you're not here by accident. You're not here because this is where you always come. You're not here simply because your mama and daddy made you to. You're here by divine appointment. Nathaniel just wasn't sitting in that tree. And I'm assuming it was warm. It was probably hot in Israel in those months. And we've been looking a little bit at trees. I can't remember who I was looking at trees with in Israel. Maybe me and Adam, how different they were. 
They're a little low thing. It looks like a scrub brush to me. You'd have to kind of get down there to get up under them. And there was Nathaniel. He said, I saw you this morning. I know where you're at. When the car's going off the road, he knows where you're at. When, uh, when there looks like there's not going to be any hope left, he knows it. When you eat up from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet with cancer, he knows it. He knows exactly where you're at. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? That there are no surprises to God. Surprises to us, dreadful new to us, news to us, but nothing from God. Nothing has ever upset him in any way. Nothing has took him by shock. And he said, well, thing, I knew where you were at. I saw you sitting up under that tree this morning. And Nathaniel's result, notice what he said, and Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Display who he was, and Nathaniel was saved. What a wonderful, wonderful, glorious thing that our God, no matter what's going on, He knows what we're doing. He knows what's going on. He knows what's being said. And that, that is the God that we serve. Matthew 26, very familiar verses of Scripture, much more sobering than the, the text we read, we read concerning Nathaniel, a little bit more uh, in depth, a little bit more sobering, but the very same top of knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 31, for all of you that know uh, your Bible, they're in they're in Gethsemane. They had instituted the Lord's Supper and, and they sang their song and then they went together to Gethsemane. Now, listen, there's no problem with the way that we observe the Lord's table. But you know, have you ever thought about it? They didn't hang it on the post and leave, did they? They stayed in fellowship. They went down to Gethsemane and there was some praying to be done. And none of them were very good at it, but the Lord, where are they? He put his nine in one place, his special three in another place, and he put himself in another place still and went before the throne. And, and, and we find that that is what they're doing here. Now they're down at Gethsemane, and the Lord has, re has revealed what was going to happen. In verse 31, the Bible says this, Then saith Jesus unto them, meaning the eleven, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written. Now listen, if it's written, if it's holy writ, it's going to happen. But I want you to see they immediately question the Lord Jesus Christ. You ever question the word of God? Every one of us has, right? Every one of us has said, you know, can that really be right? You, you must need to suffer for my name's sake. Can, is that correct? Sure it is. Absolutely it is. But you know what? It's crawled to the flesh, isn't it? I don't like to suffer. I don't, I don't like to have problems with my flesh and my body. But you know what? It's coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming. And, and, and so we find... That as uh, the Lord Jesus says, it's written, so it's going to happen. It's, it, it, it's in the Word of God, so it will transpire. Ye shall be offended of me. Offended of the person of Christ. Offended because you know Him. Offended because of the relationship that you have unto Christ. And you know what? Many of us are still in that same lane today. Offended of our stance with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we get in the right crowd. Amen? Amen. And so we find that was the situation that uh, the Lord Jesus told His church. The Bible says it's written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you unto Galilee. That's where they were to meet. And Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of me, yet will I never be offended. You know what? Uh, one thing, Peter did have a big mouth. But you know what else? He believed it. 
He really thought that at the time. I won't never be offended. And you know why he believed that? Smooth sailing. Yeah. And, and, and you know, he was in a familiar place. The Bible says of Gethsemane where they had resorted thither many times. Mm -hmm. Look, he knew where he was. He was familiar with the area and the territory and the place. You know what? It's easy to come up with big bragging stuff being in it. There's not a place, probably, except maybe Eric might know a few more. There's not a place you could tell me about, probably, in Stewart County that I could not take you. But what about South America? What about in the jungles of Guyana? Totally different thing. I'll make my brags here and say, I can take you anywhere you want me to in Stewart County. But when you get in the jungles of uh, South Africa, you know what? You got me over one. I don't know where I'm going. So before we get too down on Peter, put yourself in his spot. And yeah, we probably would have said something along the same lines, unless we honor the Word of God. If the Word of God said it, it must be that way. No, I never thought I would. I would, I, I would give up on you, but the Bible says it, so it must be true, right? Verse 34. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that, 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 that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice or three separate times. And Peter said unto him, Though I would die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise all the other disciples. Amen. And they began to sing, I will, I, I will not deny thee some, didn't they? I will not be moved. That they were, right? right? Circumstance and situation changed, and they were. They, they, they were moved by the opposition. They were moved by what was set before them. So never, ever, ever brag on the flesh because it will happen. Gospel of John chapter 11. He knows my name. John 11 and verse 39. John 11 and verse 39, very familiar verses of Scripture. Never read this text and think that Jesus wept grieving over Lazarus. Very, the Bible's uh, very clear that he wept over their unbelief, their lack of confidence, uh, their lack of faith in his ability. <clears throat> no matter what's going on in your life, he's able. No matter what you've been taught about finality, He's able. You can't get much more than graveyard dead, can you? Mother's been dead a week, a month, and four days. To me, that's about as dead as you can get. Ain't it? You think the Lord will be able to raise her up if it's so pleasing? I know He could. I'm certainly. I don't think it's part of His plan, but if it is, blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> And we'll find that their faith was much like unto ours. Verse 39, the Bible says, And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. And Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he had been dead four days. Now that was before you were embalmed. That's before they took the innards outwards. And, and, and he was rotted just as sure as my name is what it is. And Martha knew it. The people around them knew it. And she said, listen, Lord, he's rotted. You know what? No matter what a right and vile person you think you are, God is the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ stands above that. Listen, you can't get more, any more dead in four days, can you? He was stinking. He was, he was vile, and God brought a live man forth out of there. That's the God of the Bible. That, that, that's the God that the Bible teaches and not the God of this world that we serve today. And, and so we see, he gave a direction, and immediately Martha had doubt. Immediately Martha said it can't be done. And Jesus said unto, unto her, Said I not unto thee that if thou wouldest believe, thou shouldest see the glory of God? You want to see the glory of God? Well, I do. How did they get there? 
First of all, they had to be presented with a pretty horrible problem, didn't they? Lazarus was sick and getting worse. Somebody sinned for Jesus. He got sicker and sicker. And the Lord tarried four more days right where he was at. And then he come. Mm -hmm. You ever prayed so long you thought there's nothing else to be done? I have. No, don't tell me that my faith is the only one that's feeble here. I guess he ain't going to intervene. I guess he's not going to answer. I guess, I, guess, I guess it's just sound and brass and tinkling cymbals. Don't give up. Keep praying. Keep putting it before the Lord. And, and <laughs> he said, Martha, didn't I make you a promise? You know what? God made us a promise. We'll be at home with Him in glory someday. What a wonderful, glorious promise that He's made unto us. We will sit at His feet throughout the ceaseless ages. You know what? I claim that promise this morning. Whatever might happen in the flesh, if I get hit by a car, if you get struck by lightning, whatever may happen, He knows me by name and I will be there at the throne of Jesus. What could be better? What could be better? Yeah. And, and so we see that he addresses Martha's, not only her unbelief, but he addresses his promise to her. He addresses promises because he makes them. Verse 41, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Now, I'm no English expert, but what is that heard? What, what, what verbal context is that? To hear has heard. It's past tense for a minute. He, he wasn't just praying right then. Reckon he'd been praying all four days. Re re reckon he'd been, even from the beginning of his ministry, saying, now, I know that's going to be a hard spot for some people. And he prayed for Martha and Mary and his apostles and all the people, them, them uh, ungodly, doubting Jews that would be there that day. He says, you, 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 uh, you heard me. I know you've heard me. And so it wasn't just this little... Uh, few sentence prayer here but it was a work of prayer and a time of prayer and the Lord only knows when it really began Father I, I thank thee that thou hast heard me and I knew that thou hearest me always but because of the people that stand by I said it that they may believe that thou hast sent me and when he thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth! And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, and Jesus saith unto them, Lucy, and said it, and let him go. Now what a, what a wonderful, glorious thought. What, you know, and, and you have doubters today, me and Brother Jerry, Brother Junior was talking about how crazy people who don't believe in creation are and how they keep add, have to add to their story. <laughs> you know what? We had not had to add to ours. Genesis 1, and, and we've stuck with it, right? And, and, and just the ridiculousness of that. You know, the story of Lazarus, what they're telling now, that he was in a coma and he woke back up. Mm. Well, see... If they wrapped him up like Jews were supposed to, if he was in a coma, he'd done been suffocated on top of that. Absolutely. See, uh, God's work is not to be undone. And, and, and so, and, and I believe this fully with all my heart, he addressed him by name because he didn't want the whole pile to come out. He's always called in specifics, hasn't he? He's always called individuals. Not generalities. Lazarus, come forth. That's right. Because if he had said, just come yeah, forth, yeah. every one of them would come out Yes, that's right. So he, he did it specifically, like he does people into salvation. He came out, and he said, it's loosened. 
What a wonderful thing that he knows my name. What a wonderful thing if you're his. He knows your name too. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't have to go before him and say, hey, this is Larry again. And when they go and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your goodness. I know you're high and lifted up and sit there on your throne with majesty. Take some time and listen to me. Mm-hmm. He knows my name. Oh, there comes Larry again. <laughs> right? But isn't it a wonderful thing you can't use up his time? Absolutely. And if me and Jared's praying at the same time, it don't matter. He can de- address our individual needs, hear our supplications. If the whole world, the Lord's believers, were praying at the same time, still dealing with us individually, he knows my name. Mm-hmm. What could be better? Worth them more than all the gold in the world, if he knows your name.